So again, everybody, thank you for joining me on this workshop about creating authentic experiences for your online course. I know that many of us have come to teaching online out of necessity uh, due to the COVID virus. So I'm going to try to speak to that a little bit. When we think about authentic teaching experiences, a lot of us are still comparing it to how we remember our classrooms in a face-to-face -face setting. So I wanna be sure to make sure to address that and speak to that. Um, but I do hope that some of these authentic experience tips um, and ideas will inspire you even long after the pandemic is over. And hopefully that will be soon. So we do have three objectives today and I'm confident uh, that we can achieve them. The first one is to get a working definition going of what does it mean when we say authentic learning? Then I also want to see if we can help each of you plan your own authentic experience. And um, from the looks of it, we have people from a wide variety of disciplines. So each person here is going to probably come up with a slightly different plan. And then we also need to think about how we can prepare our students for an authentic learning experience. So let's just dive in. Now I've put up here um, a working definition of authentic learning. As you can see, this does come from Wikipedia, but I, I do feel that this is appropriate and speaks to us on a lot of different levels. So, although I don't ordinarily read from slides, um, I'll go ahead and read this one to you. Authentic learning is an instructional approach that allows students to explore, discuss, and meaningfully construct concepts and relationships in contexts that involve real world problems and projects that are relevant to the learner. So it's a mouthful. As you can see, there are some words here highlighted in red, and those are going to be some things that we'll deconstruct in just a moment. Um, but what I wanted to touch on here is this idea that an authentic learning experience could be anything. It doesn't even have to be a graded assessment. So there are lots of opportunities where you can try to connect with your students. And we never know when that'll take place. So I have some tips for instructors maybe who feel like their curriculum is a little bit more regimented. How can you insert this authentic learning experience into a classroom? So I want to speak about that. And I also want to take a look at how we assess students. I think there's a movement going on right now where we're getting away from just testing our students. And when I say testing, I think about the standardized traditional exams. Uh, so there are other ways to gauge our students' skill level and knowledge base. And these are all parts of the authentic learning experience where we're going to challenge our students to think in new ways. Okay. So now that we have this working definition going, now we can talk about how we're gonna plan this and put this into hopefully your own course. So these are the four characteristics of authentic learning. Now, an activity that involves real world problems and that mimics the work of professionals. Um, the activity involves presentation of findings to audiences beyond the classroom. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that my background is in English composition. So I know personally that a lot of times my students take my course because it's a requirement, not because it's of any interest to them. So this kind of resonates with me. I understand that I have to think about how to make their work relevant to them, to the students. So this can involve bringing in people from other disciplines, guest speakers, and I can also show them hopefully ways that the one activity in an English class will impact their work in other college classrooms. The second characteristic is this idea of using open-ended inquiry. And I do believe this, again, is leaning towards the movement that we don't need to use standardized exams all the time for our students. Uh, if you use open-ended inquiry, you can better assess your students' level of understanding, um, and you get to see kind of a demonstration of their critical thinking process. So some of that you lose in a standardized exam. So these are all different ways that we can look at authentic learning and, and how to get away from just this traditional mode of students must study and then we test them. 
And number three, students engage in discourse and social learning in community of learners. I find this particularly relevant for online students. I think many students will say that they feel like they have to teach themselves in an online course. And we want to get away from this idea that, you know, students feel isolated or, you know, that they're kind of just floating out there all on their own. Um, so we really want to continue this level of community, um, even in an online setting. Oops. I think we have uh, some drawing going on here. <laughs> uh, and number four, we do want students to direct their own learning. Now, directing their own learning doesn't mean that they, that they feel isolated. Um, directing their own learning means that students feel like they have a level of control and that their input is valued. There are different ways to go about this. Um, for instance, one such way that you can help students feel like they're directing their own learning is you could ask them to pick a, a topic. Even if you narrow down the the scope of acceptable topics, you could give them, you know, a choice of three or four different options. Or you could even ask students to submit formal proposals of what it is that they would like to study. So again, all of these things contribute to the idea that the student has a little bit of say in their own education. All right, shall we move on? All right, so of course, before we can figure out if our students really um, get to experience an authentic learning style classroom, uh, we need to know what it is we're, we're trying to achieve. And so this, of course, does start with the learning objectives. Now, again, I do realize that some learning objectives are already predetermined by departments, and that's okay. You know, another way to think about learning objectives is to think about it even from a weekly or modular level. And a strong learning objective focuses on these um, action verbs, I guess is the easiest way to say it. So you'll notice they are highlighted in red. I like to keep the the objective kind of all the way through very consistent. Um, I like to start with, you know, by the end of this week or by the end of this course, students will be able to, um, and then you fill in the blank. So I did try to come up with some different ideas here to represent all different fields of study. So, right, kind of let you look those over. For instance, um, in a math course, Students will be able to solve equations and reduce fractions. You know, I love this goal because this really identifies for the students that they have to show their work. We need to know how they arrived at a specific answer. Um, sometimes, you know, their work is equally, if not more important than the answer that they arrived at. There are evaluations, critiques. Students will be able to execute a professional sales call. Uh, you know, I, I love this idea that we can have students simulating uh, real world experiences. All right, it's very quiet. If you have any concerns or if I'm moving too fast, please let me know. So when it comes time to planning this authentic experience, there are four different areas here to focus on. Of course, the outcome, that again goes right back to those learning objectives. What is that desired end result? What do you want your students to do? Um, if you know that ultimately this is where you want them to arrive, um, then you can build up a bunch of exercises to help them achieve that end goal. Context is where do you want your students to go? Now, I find this really fascinating for an online course because sometimes we feel like our students are, well, sometimes we don't know where they are or else we just feel like they're glued to their computer. Um, but they are still able to move about and go places. An example that I have of this is I recently worked with an instructor who was very disappointed that due to the pandemic, he couldn't get together with his class and they could go outside and read uh, poetry. This is an activity that he had always done in a face-to-face -face setting. Now, what we do know about our students is that most of them have cell phones. 
So we were actually able to recreate that same feeling instead of giving it up entirely, you know, let's recreate it. Um, and so he picked out a poem. He asked each of his students to read one line of the poem. Everybody had their own assignment um, with the condition that they must record themselves reading that line of the poetry in an outdoor setting. Uh, students were able to do this even just with their cell phones. And when they submitted their, their recording, the instructor actually linked them all together. Um, and it was just such a great viewing experience for the students. Um, you know, he could still send them out into the field, <laughs> literally, to read the poetry. So think again, what do you want your students to do? You are not obligated to make them sit in front of a computer. You can give them tasks and assignments. Um, so be creative and be specific. As far as assessments go, um, what do you want your students to do? What do you want them to produce? Um, is there something tangible? Hopefully by the end of the course, you know, they're going to have something more than just a series of exams. So are they just taking notes? Are they producing media? Are they putting together PowerPoints? Are they... Um, simulating labs, exercises, there, there's so many. And then as far as technology goes, um, this is more of just a cautionary thing. Uh, tell your students upfront what you expect from them, what kind of tools are they going to need. And oftentimes it's nothing even that crazy and outlandish, but it's just nice to clarify this early on. So are they using their notebook? Are they using some sort of a webcam, um, if they have to record themselves, is this something they can do with their cell phone? So just think about this in a context of if you were getting ready for class, what would you need? All right, so this leads us to, well, what do we do with our adult learners? Um, and this is a new concept for me anyway, and it's called andragogy. Um, and this is how do we understand adult learners? So these were kind of some basic concepts of this theory. Adults must understand why the content is important and relevant. Uh, when it comes to children, I think there's a common phrase out there, you know, when students or, students or children ask, well, why do I need to do this? You know, an adult will say, because I said so. Uh, this really does not work well with your adult learners. Um, you need to make those connections early on for them. Even if it's a long roundabout journey, um, students and adults, they just need to know ultimately what is the end goal. The second point, um, I think that's true of any learners, but maybe especially so with adults, is that they need to learn through experience. I know I took a cooking course and the first time that a recipe was presented, we watched the chef, you know, make it from start to finish. But then the next day, for those of us who are enrolled in the course, we had to do it ourselves. I mean, that's really crucial. Not everything can just be a demonstration. There always needs to be a piece where the students are actively engaged in learning hands-on. We also know that adults approach uh, learning as problem solving. So what is it that they are trying to learn, to solve, to change? Um, while philosophy is an important aspect, ultimately there has to be a reason behind it. Like what, what is the purpose of this activity? Okay. And then finally, the very last one there is adults learn best when the topic presents immediate value. Um, so again, just trying to point out to your students, why is this information? Why is this project? Why is this relevant? When are you going to use it? What's the purpose of it? Um, making those connections clear for them. Right? If they feel like it has some immediate value, they're more likely to engage with it. Okay. I do have some questions for you coming up, um, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about problem-based learning. Now, I know I have this lovely diagram here, um, but I thought a good example of this was actually a movie reference. And I would like to point out that I am in no way, shape or form um, paid to endorse or promote this movie. Um, but if any of you have ever seen the movie, 
Mona Lisa smile, then um, maybe you've remembered this particular scene, but there was a temporary art instructor who was hired to teach at a very prestigious academy. And when she walked into the classroom, she initially went with the traditional curriculum. I assume it was created by the previous instructor. But her concern came about when she realized that the students already knew pretty much all of the material that was on the existing curriculum. For all intents and purposes, it appeared that they had memorized the textbook. So she decided to switch gears and she showed images to her students. And she didn't give them any point of context. She would show them pictures of paintings, canvases, maybe some photographs, collages. Um, and each time she showed them a new image, she repeated the same question, is this art? And this threw the students off balance. And I think that's a, a key with problem-based learning, if you're trying to define it, is taking your students out of their comfort zone. So this diagram that you see here um, is basically a representation of that same scenario. Now you could uh, further refine it, you know, maybe not do such an impromptu activity, uh, maybe have it a little bit more structured and ready to go, but it's the same basic idea. You're going to ask your students a question and it's not something that they could prepare for. It's not where they went home, they read a chapter of the textbook and now they're ready to repeat in their own words what they learned. Um, instead, you're going to give them a question. They don't see it coming. They haven't practiced or rehearsed for it. Um, and they need to go through a series of steps. They're going to have to list the known as well as the unknown. And this is a clear area where you might want to facilitate your expectations. Make them write out a bulleted list. What are all the things that they know? Do they have a working definition of art? What do they know about the image that they're looking at? Uh, what things are they still confused about? This will help them determine what they need to do. Um, and then they can also start to um, determine how they're going to get answers to those questions. So hopefully if this is a group assignment, everybody is going to attempt to do some research to try to answer those questions. They could present the findings. And then at that point, it's really more about the reflection. You know, if we go back to the Mona Lisa smile, right? It's not even if this image is a piece of art or not a piece of art. It's really more about the reflection. Like how did they arrive at that answer? You know, what was their critical thinking process? So try to think about problem-based learning as just activities you could do in your course. Again, not everything has to be a graded activity. It can be a way to connect. It's a way to use synchronous sessions in an online course where you could have a discussion. Okay, so now I'm hoping you'll chime in. I know it's been awful quiet in here. So we know that there are some potential challenges for creating this authentic learning atmosphere, particularly in an online setting. So um, either you know, feel free to raise your hand or just go ahead and use the chat pod. Um, but what are some strategies that you could use? So maybe pick one or two of the situations uh, that maybe you can speak to personally. So. We know that our students cannot meet in a face-to-face -face setting for group work. Um, thoughts or ideas on this one? What about large rosters? Because we know that's going to impact, you know, your grading workload. And finally, our third option here is, what about the difficult part of assessing the student's level of engagement? How do you know if they truly understand the material or not? All right, I'm turning the floor over to everybody. So feel free to chat away.
All right, I see some answers pouring in. So for large rosters, I see a lot of recommendations of putting students into small groups using breakout rooms online. You can put them in different groups during class. All right, if you use breakout groups, you can have them report after 10 to 15 minutes what they worked on as a group. Any ideas for how to assess your student's level of engagement? I scroll up, I see some things here. Sarah uses Qualtrics and OneDrive to fill out as they talk in small groups and then she um, shows that back to them as in a large group. Great, yes. Meet with students individually during virtual office hours. Absolutely. All right, so somebody who doesn't um, use synchronous sessions very much other than for office hours, um, likes to use discussion boards with responses, yes. Cold calling, yes, agreed. I, I love all of these ideas. All right, the CIDL team came up with some ideas as well, but I, I always love hearing what everyone else comes up with because uh, we get some of our best ideas from you. So. We had some ideas here. Um, separate collaborate sessions, office hours. Um, I don't know if any of you noticed, but just very recently, all of the NIU students have now uh, been added to Zoom as licensed users. So you could potentially ask your students to meet outside of, you know, synchronous sessions, um, and they can set up their own Zoom meetings. As far as large classrooms go, if you haven't heard of it yet, there's also another discussion board option called Yellow Dig, which has a lot of gamification properties. Um, and once you set up your own criteria, it auto grades for you, which is particularly helpful um, when you have large groups of students. For the lower stakes assignments, if you can get a hold of a TA, definitely let them take a hand at participating in the grading process. And then as far as assessing students' level of engagement, try to do the required meetings, whether that's synchronous sessions or signing up for office hours. Peer evaluations is a really good one. Um, if they feel like they're going to be graded by their own peers, they're more likely to participate instead of you know, kind of taking a step back. Multiple drafts and revisions, all good ideas. So where are we at with assessing these results? Now, um, you can come up with different things. I, I don't want you to think that these bullet points directly connect to the ones that are across uh, from each other. There are different ways to look at this. But how are students going to share their experiences? Um, this is, again, that part about trying to take away that feeling of isolation, which happens a lot of times in an online setting. So you can have them create or collect their own artifacts to share with the group. Reflections are a crucial part in this, asking what they've learned or how they arrived at their answer. Written work, but it doesn't just have to be written work. We know that there's all types of things that you can do now with asking your students to record themselves. Creative work, presentations, labs, mock scenarios. And then this is another piece here is, well, how are they going to be measured and by whom? If you do a role play exercise, are you going to bring in somebody from maybe the actual workforce to evaluate them, to give them feedback? Is there going to be peer assessment, self-assessment? Um, are you going to have a panel of judges? 
right? Journals, assessments, all different ideas here. Um, I remember I had one instructor who at a TEI event, I think, uh, said, well, I'm a nurse and, you know, a lot of our course curriculum is pretty much uh, regimented. It, it's already been, you know, thought out and we don't have a lot of opportunity to insert, you know, one of these authentic learning experiences for our students. Um, and one great suggestion that came up was that you could just ask students, even just as a class exercise, again, doesn't have to be a graded assessment, was to go out and find examples of personal protective equipment that people have uh, designed themselves in the face of the COVID pandemic. We have a lot of teachers, though not at NIU, um, but at other schools and institutions and childcare workers who are trying to come up with their own personal protective equipment. Um, and you could ask your students who are nurses to evaluate them, you know, which ones were good examples of protective wear, which ones were not and why. Um, and this is all again, making a current situation very relevant uh, to their coursework. So again, just lots of ideas here. Um, they in turn became the experts on that, on that particular activity. So this stage, I think we can kind of switch gears here and we can talk about preparing students for authentic learning. You know, I was hesitant with the slide to list this out. Um, I didn't want you to think that this needs to happen in the order in which it appears on the slide. So um, use your imagination. It can happen in any order. But things that you can do to help your students get ready for, you know, this problem-based learning activity, this authentic learning experience, because we know we're going to put them out of their comfort zone. Right away, I would recommend trying to establish participation requirements. Um, sometimes when things are new and unfamiliar, students go silent. So it's always good to have specific requirements for each student's level of participation. Uh, don't let them hide in a crowd. And you can set that expectation with rubrics. You can also provide exemplars. A good way to do this is to show them examples that are both positive and maybe um, in need of some work. I think this is particularly helpful for students so that they have a point of context of what you want them to achieve and what you want them to avoid. You can ask them to share professional experiences they've had. If you feel that they're already you know, working in this field, you could share your own professional experiences, or again, you can bring in you know, some guest speakers just to vary it up. And of course, as always, we try to write as specific of instructions as possible with the understanding that you still may need to further clarify it. I do have some specific examples coming for you. Um, But let's talk about what's the online advantage. I think there's been, you know, some disappointment that's been uh, voiced from instructors and students that they miss being together in an online, or pardon me, in in face-to-face -face, uh, situation. But we do have some tools at our disposal now, uh, maybe that you didn't use when you were face-to-face -face with your students. Okay. We do know that we have a lot of multimedia now. Lots, right? You, you could use Zoom, you could use Blackboard, you could ask students to record things on their own time. Uh, so lots of things going on here. You can ask for proposals from your students. You can do virtual conferences, you can do drafts, right? I hate to read through all of these on here. I do like using, creating um, or reusing work from prior students. This is um, a great activity if you have time or if you can make time, I should say. You can bring in work that your students have submitted maybe from previous semesters. And one activity that you can do is you can ask your students to grade it. 
this is particularly helpful if you have a grading rubric that was already established for that assignment. Um, you should ask them maybe to do this as a solitary assignment. No outside help, right? You don't want them conferencing with their peers. After they've gone through this assignment and they've graded it, you can then break them up into groups. And as a group, they need to grade it, which means that now as a group, they have to agree upon the grade the student should have received for a project. Um, this is really a good way to just to get your students involved, to feel like they are actually in control of their own work that they produce. Um, and they have to talk about it. You know, if somebody said, well, I thought that that PowerPoint presentation was a B and somebody else thought that that PowerPoint presentation was a C, they have to work together to figure out why they had a discrepancy when they had a grading rubric right in front of them, right? So it, it's a very powerful tool um, and it's still something that you can easily replicate in an online environment. So, all right. Let's move on. We have some adventures from the virtual halls of NIU. So we do have some faculty here who actually shared some of their stories with us. And I'd like to go ahead and share those with you. All right, so the very first one that we have was the electoral judge experience. Now, if you'll notice here, the instructor said that they were asked to volunteer to be an electoral judge. I really don't know if you could do that. So I'm assuming this is a simulation experiment. Um, but nonetheless, students had to get into the role of becoming this electoral judge. It shows the alignment with the specific course objectives. And then there are the corresponding activities. So we're looking at readings and lectures, um, a personal reflection on the experience. And then there is a term paper proposal um, to, oh, pardon me, a term paper to propose an electoral reform. So once these students actually have simulated volunteering to become an electoral judge, right, they, they tried to get into that role as much as possible. Now that they've had that experience, they want to take a the time to propose maybe how this could be improved. So it's kind of an interesting idea here. The faculty describe themselves as the challenger. They are encouraging students to grapple with what it means to model electoral democracy. Kind of an unusual one. Some role playing. Um, I imagine not all of this was graded. I imagine there were bits and pieces of it. But again, this would be a great activity if you're allowed a synchronous session. We have one for a sales call experience. I wish I could sit in on this. I'm very curious to see how this works out. Um, if any of you have ever worked in sales, you'll know that a lot of these calls are pre-scripted. So if you have to play the role of somebody who's working in telephone sales, um, I wonder if they had to stick to their to their script. But for the alignment here, you can see that students will be able to plan and execute a professional sales call using technology. Um, and in this one, the faculty said that they were the storyteller. They shared their own real experiences and scars from the revenue generating trenches. So I, I think this is worthwhile. Um, I imagine, I could be wrong, but I imagine that the students might actually um, also get to reflect and weigh in on how the sales call went. Were there areas that could be improved? Uh, were there really strong aspects? So again, it's this idea that they have to simulate a sales call. Um, and you could play around with that. You could ask your students to be the customer, or you could ask your students to be the well, the telemarketer. This was my own. Um, I just wanted to throw this in here. So it was all about deconstructing the college level essay. And my assignment was to have my students on the very first day of class take a pop quiz. I believe I called it something like, um, are you a know-it-all? 
And this quiz was, yes, designed to throw them, you know, a little off. They, they weren't expecting it. Nobody had studied for it. It was the very first day of class. Um, and it, they were all open-ended questions. So I would ask things like, you know, how long is the ideal thesis statement? What is the most important aspect of the essay and why? And I did generate a little bit of goodwill. I promised my students that they could have, you know, five points, something very low, very minimal. Um, but I would give them all five points as long as they made every effort to answer the questions. They couldn't leave it blank and they couldn't say something to the tune of, I don't know. So any, any answer was better than no answer. The follow up to this was all of the exercises planned throughout the duration of the course. So we're talking textbook readings, PowerPoints, students are writing their own essays, they're revising them. Um, but then at the last day of class, I repeated the pop quiz. And I asked students to grade themselves after we went over the, their answers. Um, and I did hand back their original quiz. So it sounds negative, but in this instance, I, I kind of was enforcing this idea of repetition. We want our students to continually keep practicing their skills. And students were then also able to assess their own level of advancement uh, because they, they actually had the two quizzes side by side and they were interested um, with their first answers versus their last answers. By the end of the class, you know, that pop quiz was a breeze for them. Um, but they, they got a good chuckle out of, you know, where they started and where they ended up. Okay. So what makes authentic learning effective? Well, we're trying to connect with our students and those connections can be big or small. They could be graded, they can be ungraded, um, but we never know when they're going to happen. So we're trying to reach out to our students as often as possible because we just don't know when they're going to make that connection when they're going to start thinking about this course more than just you know getting through their assignments. The long-lived uh, attachments come with practice, right? Repeated practice. We want our students to keep going, keep practicing, keep experimenting. Uh, we want to break th this regimen of students, you know, reading their textbook, watching the PowerPoints, and then taking a quiz. Uh, we want them to keep practicing their skills. So keep throwing them, you know, a little bit off balance, surprise them. Um, if you surprise your students, they will surprise you. And then new contexts that need to be explored. So yes, we do want to surprise them, but we also want to make students feel like they are empowered to take on these new challenges. They do already have an existing skill set that will help them tackle these new challenges. So take the context that they understand something now and apply it to a bigger picture. Okay, so at this point, I'd say we're doing pretty well on time. We've got about 10 to 15 minutes left. I would like to get a little bit of feedback from you. I have put the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning's uh, contact information up on the screen. So if you have any questions or concerns, please do feel free to reach out. But I'd actually like to hear a little bit more about some of these authentic learning experiences uh, that you have or is there an area of your course that you're struggling with? I think this is the time now since it's a workshop where you can ask your peers for some input. So any takeaways from this? Things you're particularly proud of or are any of you looking for specific areas to improve? Uh, this is Sarah Marsh. And hi, Sarah. One, hi, Megan. Um, you know, this is interesting to think about. I think I, I teach in the business school, so we like to have a lot of things that put them in a place of being a business professional. My challenge is just two things. One is group work, and the second is grading. 
So I can have them go through this authentic experience, but it's hard for me to get them to get the feedback they need when I have so many of them. So um, it, it it's just a, a balance that I have a hard time finding. So any suggestions would be welcome. Okay, I bet there are lots of suggestions out there. So as far as feedback goes, are you trying to gather feedback from your students about their No, their and, and to, just to, to give them feedback on their work. Ah, okay. You know, just the grading element is just, um, you know, and so, you know, you can do work in groups, with, but then you've got the free rider issue. So there's sort of this balance there that I try to find and not always successfully. With group work, have you ever made a percentage of the points um, group um, based off of group evaluations? Yes, oftentimes, but there is so much peer pressure. You know, it, ha it, it has to be really, and, and that's okay with me if it's just really extreme they will call out their peer, but otherwise they won't. Otherwise it's just, you know, five out of five points. Yeah, otherwise it's like, yeah, everybody did their part when I know that wasn't the case. Um, but so I mean, anyway, so I'm always struggling with how to get them the feedback they need when you have these authentic projects, which oftentimes are really gray and they're not, you know, it's, uh, you have a rubric, but the rubric can't say everything. So, you know, uh, I think the more real world it is, the harder it is to grade, <laughs> I guess is what I'd say. It is. So any, I might have a couple of thoughts, but I would like to hear from everybody else. Um, I see that Carly put on here, peer evaluation was what my business professors always used. Okay. So. What else? Any thoughts on, on how to handle this? We have an instructor who has large groups of students. Um, I think some typing is taking place. I'm going to pause for a moment. This is Lynn Dykstra. One thing I have found now in the School of Nursing, I'm not allowed to give extra credit, but in School of Interdisciplinary Health Professions, I am. And I make the um, final project a group project as an extra credit option for their final project. And that way people self sort into it that want to do group work. Um, and I eliminate the people that definitely hate group work, which helps a little bit with participation. Thank you. Love it. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. I do like the idea of peer evaluations, although I do think that sometimes that they need a little bit more of a guiding hand on that. Um, something that you could do is peer evaluations before the final project, whatever that may be, is due. Um, and what I like to do is to ask students to swap whatever it is, papers, projects, uh, labs, and do a critique on it. You can ask them, what is the strongest piece? What is the weakest piece? Um, Again, I, I know my head always goes to English just because that was my field, but I would ask them to identify specific things. You know, do you have a thesis statement? Where is it? You know, can you underline it? Um, and students were actually able to, with that specific criteria, do some of that initial grading for you. And it's a, a nice synchronous session type of activity that you could do even in an online environment. Yeah, that's great. I like this idea that, I mean, in the end, you just want them to learn. I don't, I'm not assessing them for assessment sake. I just, and so if that happens with the student's help, if I can guide that, that sounds great.
Oh, I saw something else come in here. Um, short quizzes that can automatically be graded by uh, Blackboard help me with large classes and the workload. Agreed. Um, let's see, have the students write up a self-evaluation and see what insights she or he reveals about the, the work done. Absolutely. Nothing is more terrifying when you ask students to grade themselves. All right. Does anyone have any examples of, you know, this authentic learning experience that they've been able to develop now that we've been teaching online for several semesters? or problem-based learning activities. He don't <laughs> I hear a little voice. Um, Sorry, Vega, that said a may, as you know. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm teaching intro to theater this semester and I've just been having conversations with my students about current events, you know, at the top of the class, you know, anybody see the Super Bowl and the halftime show, just trying to connect, you know, the things that we're talking about in the class to things that are happening in the world right now. Um, just so that, you know, I'm reiterating that the things that I'm teaching you are useful and help us understand this this world i i know that that um, may not be helpful to everybody but that's at least with the subject matter that i'm teaching that helps quite a bit thank you gibson i i love that i know i just spoke with another faculty member who did something somewhat similar um, and she ended up at the end of every class, she would ask her students to submit some type of a short answer about what they found most helpful about the class um, and something else that they wanted to talk about. And this often led to current events, so thank you. Just inviting that discussion, yes. I know we've got about five minutes left. I am probably going to stop the recording now and I can take any questions, comments. I'll keep, you know, hanging out. Let me know if there's anything that I can clarify for you.